this video is going to be a pretty short video. We're just going to go through the different types of solids and then uh, look more specifically at alloys and kind of go a little bit further than we did before. Uh, so there's two types of solids here. We have crystalline solids and amorphous solids. Crystalline solids are like ionic compounds. If you remember, ionic form crystals, uh, they have this uh, highly repetitive arrangement here uh, where you just kind of repeat the formula unit over and over again, and they form these nice, organized, perfectly aligned structures where you have the opposite charges kind of lining up. So if you look here, this would be an example of a crystalline solid. You can see how everything's kind of lined up perfectly. Uh, it's, it's very repetitive. Um, and then an amorphous solid, which would be like glass, has uh, a lot more disorder in the overall structure. So if you can look here and you see it's a solid, but it's not as organized. And you wouldn't see this like perfectly arranged structure. So just want you to be aware here of the difference between these two and a quick example for each. There are other types of solids here, which we would call molecular solids. These are covalent substances that uh, can be a solid. So typically they're, they're orderly structures here, but they have molecules kind of at each of the lattice points. And they're gonna have a relatively low melting point because in order to get them uh, to melt here, you're going to be breaking the IMFs in each of these. You're not breaking bonds. To break bonds, it would take a lot more energy. So to break the IMFs, it does take some energy, but not as much as if you're breaking a bond. Uh, so things like water. Water is a covalent uh, molecule that can be a solid. Or dry ice, which is CO2, kind of in the solid form. Uh, phosphorus, sulfur, sulfur, which is S8, has this ring structure. They are covalent substances, essentially, that can be solids. So we call these molecular uh, solids. And again, you, you can get them to melt pretty easily because you're not breaking bonds. You're just breaking uh, IMFs here. We've already looked at ionic solids pretty much in this course. Just remember they have this very uh, organized structure. You have the ions, the plus and the minus themselves are what are occupying the lattice uh, points. Remember, we said you should be familiar with how this would look. Uh, you could be asked questions about this in terms of uh, on a molecular level here, realizing that the plus uh, lines up with a nearby minus, and it just kind of repeats the formula unit over and over again, and they form these nice organized structures. They have a very high melting point here because of this nice orderly arranged structure. So any ionic compound like sodium chloride, calcium chloride, and so on, we call this closest packing. Essentially, these larger anions get arranged in a way so that they all tightly fit together. And then the uh, cations, which are always smaller, fit kind of inside the holes. And this maximizes the oppositely charged attractions and minimizes any of the same charges uh, repelling here. So you can kind of see that here in this picture. You kind of have the larger anions lining up and then the cations fitting in the hole and it just repeat over and over again these very organized structures. You should be familiar with these covalent network solids. All right, this is another example of a covalent solid, but they're called network solids because we have these uh, large networks of covalent bonds. All right, remember, think of something like a diamond where every carbon atom is covalently bonded to every other carbon atom. So if you look here at this picture, this would be like the structure of a diamond. Uh, every carbon atom is covalently bonded to every other carbon atom. So if you want to get this to uh, melt, you have to break every single bond. You're not just breaking IMFs like we saw in the molecular salts. You have to break actual bonds, which takes a lot more energy, which is why they have much higher uh, melting points here. Graphite is another form of carbon, but you kind of have uh, these carbon atoms arranged in these hybridized rings. Uh, you can kind of see that here in the picture. And because the electrons are kind of uh, delocalized, they can kind of are free to move. So that's why graphite is able to conduct. So this is just showing you uh, some of these examples here of these covalent network solids. And make sure you understand that idea that if you want to 
uh, you know, melt or make one of these boil, you have to actually break bonds. And there's a lot of bonds to break. And that's why uh, the melting point is so great. Some other covalent network solids here are quartz or silica, SiO2, which is basically sand. Uh, this structure actually has these SiO4 tetrahedrals kind of connected together here. Uh, then you also have glass as being a network solid. Basically, it's this quick cooling of this melted silica. You get this amorphous solid. Uh, other compounds are being added before cooling uh, to give you the different uh, types of glass. So just be aware of these covalent network solids and understand that they typically have these uh, large networks of these strong covalent bonds that need to be broken in order to get them to melt or boil. We also have what we call atomic solids that exist. Uh, this would be things that have uh, LDFs keeping them together. For example, some of the noble gases here can form solids, all right? And they're, they're not necessarily bonded to other atoms. They just have these uh, LDFs, which are holding them together to allow them to be in the solid form. And we also have like metals, which are uh, solids. We call it, it would be an atomic solid as well, because it's just the atom itself having these um, free floating valence electrons uh, that kind of keep them together, but they're not really bonded to anything else. So if you just have an atom itself, an element itself that is a solid, that would be an atomic solid. Just real quick here, a little bit more about metals. We already know uh, the electron C model here for metals. We understand that there's this like C of electrons, these free floating valence electrons here that are free to move between all the different uh, metal cations here. And that's what allows the metal to exist by itself. There's another model here called the band model. That's just more or less for your reference. It's not something you need to know for me or for AP. I'm more concerned that you understand that the metals have this free floating valence electrons that can move around. And that's what leads to the properties here of the metals. Before we're done here, we want to talk about alloys again. We know that alloys are mixtures of two or more elements with at least one of those elements being a metal, but there's two types of alloys that we need to know about here for AP. The first type is called a substitutional alloy, uh, and basically what happens in a substitutional alloy, it kind of sounds like the name. Basically, you have a uh, metal atom being replaced uh, by another atom of a similar size. Basically, the radii are close. It doesn't have to be exact. I've seen some examples here uh, where the radii can be a little bit different. Um, to give you an idea here about what this means, if you look here um, for the formation of brass, you can see here that you would have copper, but then kind of like a copper atom gets replaced in the lattice here by a zinc. So a zinc kind of comes in, it's about the same size of a copper, so it can form this substitutional alloy. Basically, a copper atom gets substituted with a zinc. A zinc basically goes in the place of a copper alloy or copper atom here. And basically, uh, the reason this works is because they have similar sizes. Uh, basically, uh, the properties of the alloy pretty much remain the same. Uh, as the original metal, it's still going to basically be malleable and ductile, and it's also going to have a similar density. That kind of makes sense. If, you know, the atoms that are being replaced are a similar size, you would expect it to have about the same size density because you're not going to have more stuff packed in a given area here. Uh, so substitutional alloys would be like brass, sterling silver. You're just taking uh, an atom that's about the same size and replacing or substituting uh, for another atom here. So you definitely should understand this on a molecular level. AP has sometimes asked questions on this about like which atom would be involved here or which atom would be best to form the substitutional alloy. And you have to look at the sizes. Uh, you might have to draw it. Uh, I've seen stuff like that. So you definitely need to understand this idea of a substitutional alloy. All right. You're being having an atom with a similar size replacing another metal atom, and it would still be malleable, still ductile, and it's gonna have a similar density uh, as the original metal. The second type of alloy is an interstitial alloy, 
which basically means that you're taking an atom and you're kind of filling in the holes here of the metal. So for example, uh, when you're forming steel, you have iron and then you have some carbon atoms kind of coming in and filling in the holes between the metals. All right, so this is an interstitial. Because you're kind of adding atoms here and not replacing, uh, the uh, properties kind of change a little bit. Uh, it's gonna become more rigid, it's gonna be less malleable and ductile, so you'd expect it to maybe become harder. And it's also gonna have a higher density because you kind of are still taking up the same amount of space, but now you have more atoms in that space. So you have more stuff in a given area so you would expect the density to increase, all right? So steel is the perfect example of this interstitial type of alloy, and you need to kind of understand this on a molecular level. You kind of have your original metal, and you're adding in um, atoms here, kind of filling in the empty space. So definitely understand both types of alloys and what's going on with this for the AP exam.